for joining us this afternoon for our special end of the semester event, uh, Refugee Resettlement in Wisconsin with Jewish Social Services. Uh, my name is John Bichard. I'm a dual degree graduate student at the La Follette School of Public Affairs and UW School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, this semester, I'm serving as a program assistant for IRIS NRC, and I'm very ex excited to hear from our speakers today. Um, prior to beginning, there's a couple things that we have to cover, so I will just go over those. Um, today's sponsor is the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center. IRIS NRC supports and enhances global awareness and inspires informed thinking about the complexities of our world. We provide resources and expertise to K through 12, post-secondary educators, students, and the community at large. Um, I would also like to take the time to thank our co-sponsors. So thank you to the International Studies major, the Educational Policy Studies at the School of Education, and the Immigrant Justice Clinic at the UW-Madison Law School. Uh, we are grateful for all of your support, and we ask that you please check out their website uh, for more information on their programs and also to please follow them on social media. Um, SE Lunchner will be running tech support today, so if you have any challenges, please reach out to her on the chat function. Uh, we'll also be recording today's event and sharing the link and digital resources in a post-event email. Um, you will only show up on the recording if your microphone is turned on to speak. Um, please enter any questions in the chat for the Q&A portion during the last 25 minutes of the event. Uh, we encourage all of you to ask questions to our speakers today and look forward to an active discussion with all of our participants. Um, next, I will do the UW-Madison Land Acknowledgement Statement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called they joke since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly move the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the other uh, 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Um, so with that said, uh, please let me introduce our guests for today's event. Uh, first, we have Becca Schwartz, who is the Resettlement Director for Jewish Social Services. We have uh, Gigi Hararimana, who is a case aide. Uh, for Jewish Social Services. And then finally, we have Stephanie Taylor, who is a refugee resettlement case manager. Um, so Becca, we will start with you. Um, go ahead and take it away whenever you're ready. Hello, can everyone see the presentation? Great. Um, Great, I'm, I'm glad to see such a great turnout today and, and thank you for, for showing an interest in the work that we're doing here. Um, and we're just gonna tell you about the work that we do in, in here in Madison with refugee resettlement. Uh, thank you, John, for that, uh, for that great introduction and thank you, Essie, for inviting us to participate today. So first of all, a little bit about Jewish social services. We are a social services agency. We serve um, anyone regardless of um, their religion, nationality, race, anyone uh, who needs our assistance. We do have um, a case manager who serves anyone. We have several case managers who serve specifically refugees um, through our refugee programs. Um, and we do have a specialty in uh, serving seniors, um, though that's not all that we serve. Uh, we also have senior adult programs such as L'Chaim Lunchtime Plus, which is a, a lunch program for seniors um, on, the, on the west side. And uh, if anyone's interested, there's more information about that on our website. Of course, we have refugee resettlement and we also have a chaplaincy program uh, that we that we have in order to serve the the unaffiliated unaffiliated Jewish community in Madison. 
So I always like to start with definitions because I think that's that's really important when we're talking about groups of people. These are clearly defined uh, immigration legal statuses that we're talking about. So I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page when we're talking about what is a refugee? Who is a refugee? Um, so a refugee is an individual who has a well-founded fear of persecution due to race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion who has fled their country of origin and cannot safely return. Um, for those coming to the United States, all refugees have been vetted and approved before arriving here. So I think that's really um, important to understand. In addition, uh, when we're talking about refugees and those who have been admitted to the US refugee uh, program, it means that they have first gone through this process. And I think that's a that's an important distinction because we're talking there are um, there's a refugee crisis going on right now in Europe. Um, and I'll get into a little bit uh, the context there a little bit later. This is also uh, another group that we serve special immigrant visa holders or SIV. And they are very similar to refugees in many ways. The difference is, well, the, the main thing is that their uh, reason for persecution is that they worked with our armed forces or government uh, overseas in Iraq or Afghanistan. The other, there are some sm other small differences, but when we serve SIVs and refugees in the same way when they, when they come to our program. Asylum seeker is someone who has been forced to leave their country and seek legal status directly in the United States rather than abroad. Um, once they, they are granted legal status, they become asylees and then they become eligible for benefits. When I say benefits, they become eligible for social benefits such as food stamps and Medicaid. They also become eligible for um, immigration benefits to, be, to eventually become permanent residents and eventually citizens. This is a um, humanitarian parole is something that we, I didn't even know about a year ago. And um, it has become a big part of the, the population that we're working with now. Humanitarian parole is te a temporary status that allows someone who is ineligible for admission to the United States, so ineligible to come here, um, to enter due to compelling emergency. Um, so this is the status that was given to the Afghan um, the Afghan families and individuals who came to the United States after the fall of Kabul. Um, and it is seeming like this is the status that people will get, Ukrainians will get when they come here. Um, I wanted to use this opportunity to touch, touch on Ukraine. So they will, this is what we understand right now. Uh, things are changing very quickly and every day there's new information. Part of the information that you will get as a follow-up from, from this presentation is a really helpful information guide from one of our partner agencies, HIAS, that will, um, that will give you basically all the information that is out there right now. So um, humanitarian parole, in the case of the Afghans, is um, will be a means to to be here in order to apply for asylum or to apply for SIV status if they're eligible. And Ukrainians could also apply for asylum at this time if they truly believe they can never return. Um, the crisis in Ukraine, the the conflict is just so new that. Um, the assumption is still that people will want to return um, if and when the, the conflict ends. Um, in order to become a refugee or an asylee in the, in the definition that we are saying, in the definition that you're applying for permanent resettlement, 
is that you can never return home. You believe that you can never return home. So that is a pretty serious um, distinction between, I think, groups who are, are persecuted and have had the time to decide that they will never return to their country of origin and people who are fleeing a rel relatively new conflict. So I think that that's an important distinction to make. So among this group, um, so you may have heard that our country is planning to resettle or to, to allow in, I should say, up to 100,000 Ukrainians in the next two years. The majority of them will be humanitarian parole and the plan will be for them to be able to seek temporary refuge here for up to two years. Um, a limited number will be resettlement. There is a, a program called the Lautenberg program that um, allows people to apply for refugee status based on um, being a religious minority in a country that is formerly part of the Soviet Union. So Ukraine, Ukraine does qualify for that. Um, and the religious minorities there are um, evangelical Christians, Catholics, and Jews mainly. So um, right now it looks like they will be relying on private groups and agencies for support and not agencies like JSS to do official resettlement. Um, it is more of a, a sponsorship model. And like I said, there's, there is more information um, that will be coming out, out with, with this presentation. Um, these sponsor groups were originally formed in order to help with the um, increased needed capacity to, to be able to resettle the Afghans that came in um, late last, later last year. Okay. I wanted to touch a little bit on resettlement in Wisconsin. Um, the state of Wisconsin resettlement is led by um, the state refugee coordinator, um, the Bureau of Refugee Programs, which is housed in um, the Department of Children and Families. And the other um, agencies listed here are all of the resettlement agencies such as JSS. Um, JSS is located in Madison um, and we serve Dane County. World Relief is the resettlement agency in the Fox Valley. So that's Appleton and Oshkosh. Um, Lutheran Social Services and International Institute of Wisconsin serves Milwaukee. The um, Catholic Charities of Green Bay is um, newly reopened and ECDC is our newest resettlement agency and is located in Wausau. So even last year, there were only four of us doing this. And, and since um, actually with the Afghan crisis, two new agencies opened in, in Wisconsin. And it's, um, we're quite excited to have such a, a larger group doing this, doing this important work. Here's a little bit about resettlement here. So I am a big fan of maps. Um, we, have we have welcomed over 315 refugees and SIVs to Ma the Madison area since we started this work in, uh, or restarted this work in December of 2016. Who, I mean, I guess this isn't really very interactive, but um, the blue countries, are the countries where, where we are seeing refugees coming from. Um, so th they're countries of origin. So this, can you, can everyone see my arrow? This is de the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is Central African Republic, Somalia, um, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. Those are the countries that people are, are fleeing. Um, the red countries, since a refugee needs to have left their country of origin, the red countries are the countries that they have sought, that our clients have sought refuge in. This is Chad, Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, and Zambia, um, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, 
India and Sri Lanka. And I want you to think about what the, I think it's so interesting what the purple countries are. So this is uh, Rwanda, Burundi, and Pakistan. So pocket, these purple countries are the countries where we both have um, clients who have fled from those countries and they are countries of first asylum for other populations. Um, so I, I just find it pretty interesting to think about the nature of persecution is such that people can be, you know, fleeing from somewhere and other another group of people can be seeking safety there and and be granted relative safety because they're coming from another country. The program objective of any resettlement program in our country is to help our clients to become self-sufficient in the shortest time possible. Um, and we, we have lots of discussions about what self-sufficiency looks like. How can we best help people to become self-sufficient? Is it, is it helpful that this is our goal to help to try to get people to be self-sufficient in the shortest time possible? Um, in general, that's how we keep how how we keep on being able to do this work. Um, in some ways, self-sufficiency is really ultimately what's best for the clients. Um, so, you know, being able to support their family, being able to get to work and back, get to the grocery store and back um, is, is really what I think most clients want to be able to do as soon as possible. Um, but there are, you know, there's a lot in between arriving and being self-sufficient. And so I'll get into that uh, now. Um, so this is, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. So when, when a person, when a person or family first leaves their country of origin and, um, you know, has fled, they are to first register as a refugee with the United Nations, UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. Um, the UN will then uh, review the case, uh, do some background checks and review and um, other, other things with the case interviews. Uh, and some of the cases who maybe they have relatives and friends in the United States, or maybe they are some of the more, um, some cases that are destined for here um, because they're the most vulnerable. vulnerable. Uh, their cases are referred to the Department of State, the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration or PRM. Then we have um, the Department of Homeland Security and intelligence agencies that get involved for more interviews, for background checks and vetting, for health checks, et cetera. Um, and then the cases are referred from the State Department to one of nine national resettlement agencies, such as our partner HIAS or Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services. Each of these resettlement agencies has a network of affiliates across the country that they then refer the cases on to. So the next level is the affiliates like JSS and the others in, in Wisconsin that I mentioned. And then um, thousands of private citizens and groups, um, volunteers who help with this uh, difficult yet important work of resettling refugees. The reception and placement program is the first three months of um, that a family or individual is here. And it is a very prescribed scheduled uh, program where we have to provide these core services that include some of what's listed here. Um, and uh, so this is like just plugging the families into everything that they need to be connected to, uh, in addition to starting to help them to understand and, and plan for what their goals are. Um, and like I said, it lasts 30 to, 30 to 90 days. 
and we usually go the whole 90 days because I think it's important for that intensive case management to happen then. And this is a, a grant funded program through the, the State Department PRM. So the next program I wanted to mention is refugee support services. So we don't, <laughs> often clients are a little afraid when we say, you know, there's three months and then, but we have additional programs that sort of scoop them up and continue working with them after the 90 days. Um, refugee support services is one of them. We can enroll refugees, asylees, Cuban Haitian entrants, Amerasians, uh, victims of trafficking. The, the majority of our clients are refugees, SIVs, and asylees. Um, so there is a focus on employment in this program and non-intensive case management. Um, it is client led, so we don't we don't have sort of requirements. It's more they'll let us know what they what they need and what they what support they need, um, and it, they can be enrolled for up to five years after arrival. And this one is funded by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. It's in the um, Department of Health and Human Services. And finally, we have preferred communities. This is a program that um, it, we can enroll all the same people. It's intensive case management for those with extraordinary barriers, such as um, being a single parent, having health, specific health concerns or mental health concerns, um, being HIV positive. Those are just some examples of the, the categories of, of, of um, challenges that we, of people that we can enroll. It is for up to one year, but it can be renewed. And um, there's also a sub program that we have um, that we're implementing. We started implementing last year and we're continuing this year of mental health and psychosocial support groups. That's also funded by ORR. I wanted to take some time to list some of the partners that we work with. Um, uh, it's just amazing. It, the, the number of partners that we have um, in doing this work, it's, it's so important. I wanted to give us <clears throat> a specific shout out to Open Doors for Refugees. I'll mention them late, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, we work very closely with Group Health Cooperative and um, UW Wingra Clinic, um, also Forward Service Corporation, all the schools. It's, um, it truly does take a village. It takes a whole city actually. I wanted to list some specific challenges for newcomers, uh, what, we've, what we've seen. So cultural adjustment can be a real challenge. Um, you know, very often people have heard about what life in the US is like, but it's very often people are not fully prepared and to, you know, they're here. Um, isolation is, is a challenge too. I think many of the cultures that people are coming from are just, um, not like ours, I'll just put it that way, that people are often visiting each other um, in ways that is not as easy to do here. Um, you know, lots of people are working uh, during the day and don't have time to visit each other, for example. Um, sometimes people have inappropriate expectations about how, how we are able to help them. Um, there's a sense of financial obligation to family overseas that that is a big challenge for people. Um, they have they feel like they have to support their family overseas to the detriment of maybe their family here that they're not um, able to do everything they need to do here. And then finally, becoming self sufficient in a in a foreign culture is difficult. I think we can all understand that. And then just some other challenges that we face in, in working in resettlement. Madison has a lack of affordable housing. Um, that's housing is really one of our, our biggest bottlenecks in, in determining the number of people that we can resettle. It's how many, how many apartments can we get in a year? Um, there's unpredictable arrivals. Um, <laughs> I can just tell you, we, um, the first, four months of this fiscal year, we start in October, we 
um, we got, I think, 85 people, which is a lot for us. And in the last two months, we have gotten uh, two. We'll get our actually one, and we'll get our second soon. So it it can it's really um, feast and famine, I guess I would say. Um, and it's hard to it's really it's impossible to predict how many people will be arriving when. Um, so planning it can be difficult. And then I just wanted to mention the unpredictable political climate too. Under the Trump administration, um, the number of refugees who were allowed in the country really decreased a lot. Um, and it didn't used to be, refugee resettlement did not used to be a political issue. Um, it was supported by uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle. And now it, it does seem to be a very political issue that it is not, um, not very supported by everyone across the board anymore. So I wanted to turn it over to Gigi to talk a little bit about cultural orientation. Hi everyone, my name is Gigi Haririmana. Uh, I am cultural orientation provider and we supposed to provide 15 topics to the newcomer. Sometimes seems like challenging them. Some topics looks like new and the most of the um, topics which Challenging them is housing because here the way the rent, for example, the way we pay rent here is very different to outside of US. So and US law immigration, uh, because we have to explain to them uh, some details about US law. Um, yeah, there are the importance uh, topics depend to the group of the people. Um, for example, youth, the um, what they need it should be different to the adult people. Um, also, uh, when people come here, they just have uh, some idea in their mind. They think that they will have benefit, which is maybe uh, going for like, maybe six, six months or one year or five year, which is not um, the same here. And then, yeah, the benefit cash assistance, the public assistance seems like challenging them to understand why they have to cut off the benefit and then they will be able to manage their life by themselves to be self-sufficient, yeah. Um, so, what we can understand in general about refugees, um, they are kind and they are hard worker. If we um, try to analyze the way they use to be independent, in general, most of them, they are hard worker. So I didn't let you know that even myself, I was a refugee. Um, sorry, I was a refugee in Malawi for six years and a half. Yeah, that's all about the cultural orientation. And else if you have questions, maybe you're gonna put on the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Gigi. Mm -hmm. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie to talk a little bit about our refugee mentorship program called Algerani. Okay, thank you. So I am Stephanie Taylor and I am a case manager but my role is slowly shifting to some other programs that we've run in the past, but have fizzled a bit just because of how, I know right now it's been a little slower, but with the Afghan crisis, things were very chaotic and resettlement agencies were very busy. And I'm so excited to get these programs running again. So this is one that we haven't had in a, a little bit, but we're slowly getting back together. And I wanna talk about it because it's a great way for uh, the community to get involved, and it might be something someone or many of you might be interested in. So al Jirani, it's from the Swahili Jirani neighbor and Arabic Alger neighbor. So we put two words together. I may have pronounced those wrong. I'm still learning about the program. Um, but it's a it's a volunteer program where it's it's a mentorship program. So we are pairing 
um, people in the community with refugees or refugee, you know, families maybe to have these um, partnerships where they can meet weekly and um, it's just a great way for our clients to be more involved in the community, have have more sense of community, get to know people, and also our agency as we're working for self sufficient, working towards self sufficiency with our clients. Um, you know, we have limited hours that we can also help them with things. So this is a way for them to get more support. Our clients to get more support. So here in the slide we talk about different things that mentors can help their mentees with, working on English, financial literacy, career development, public transportation, that's been a really big one, um, helping people to use the bus, the system here, and just maybe going to libraries, showing our clients local parks, um, a lot of different things that just kind of help, I, I would say our clients to thrive uh, in our community as opposed to kind of just survive and have like their their basic needs met, which are very important, but also how do we how do we do more and really um, help our refugees become part of our, our community. So right now we are slowly getting this back together and it's gonna be ongoing and developing, which is why I don't wanna to say too much about it because some things might change, but I did provide my contact info right there. And if anyone is a, even a little bit interested in learning more about this, or you know someone who might be, please share my information. I'm, I'm keeping an active list and I'll be sending out a call for action soon for people who might, who might wanna get involved. And I think it's a really good way to work with refugees, especially if you've, if you're interested, but you've never maybe had that experience, like this is a, a really, I think a good opportunity to help our Madison refugees settle into our community and please feel free to contact me. Thanks. Thank you everyone. Um, or did you have uh, any more else uh, to just, talk about Becca? I just have one more slide. Oh, sure. Go um, ahead. Just other ways that people can get involved if they are looking. Um, so we work we work very closely with Open Doors for Refugees as sort of our main volunteer agency. That we um, they're just a volunteer group. Uh, and if you feel like volunteering, maybe in a somewhat less intense way than Algerani, which is a great program, it will become a great program. Um, Open Doors is always looking for more refuge more volunteers to work with refugees and that might be that might look like helping set up apartments it might look like um driving people to appointments that sort of thing uh keep an eye on our website and on facebook to see if there's other ways that you can get involved um we also are relaunching our cara program cara stands for community action for refugee arrivals um, and that is a group of people that that will come together to um, perform some of the services like setting up, a, collecting donations in order to set up an apartment, providing the the driving to appointments for one family. So it's um, a pseudo sponsorship program, but uh, JSS remains responsible for uh, the core services. And then finally, um, on our website, you can see that we're hiring for several positions, including um, refugee case manager and uh, social services case manager. So for if there's anyone out there who's graduating with a social work degree, um, please check it out. Check out both of those positions. And that is that is the end. So I'll turn it over to to John. Thank you, uh, Becca, Gigi, and Stephanie. Uh, that was uh, very interesting. Um, so uh, I'm gonna ask you, all of you, a couple of questions and then we will open it up to our participants uh, to ask questions of all of you. Um, so the first uh, question is, what was your personal and professional journey that led you into uh, humanitarian work? So uh, Becca, we can start with you. Thanks for that question. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I have <laughs> my my um, education. I have an industrial engineering degree and an MBA. Um, so those are not often 
degrees that you find in this line of work. Um, after my MBA, I went into the Peace Corps and I served in Senegal for two years. And then I um, found myself in Uganda. I was working for um, social businesses, um, selling, I was, I was mostly working in solar lighting. Um, and then I came back after actually a total of 10 years abroad in Africa in various parts. And um, I like the idea of giving up totally sort of that international aspect was not what I wanted. So I was in the right place at the right time. JSS was starting its restarting its refugee resettlement program and um, and they were looking for someone to to run it. And so I was I was there and I'm really um, thrilled to be here. It's uh, it's challenging work, but really rewarding work. Great, thank you. Uh, Stephanie, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um, when SE asked us to speak, I was thinking, oh, I really wanna inspire people to get a global education. And I I have more of a tale of regret because I, I did not actually spend most of my education or time working you know, internationally. I didn't go abroad. I kind of speak some Spanish, but I don't know any other languages. And so my story is a little more backwards and I, I wish that I had a lot of this experience and I still hope to get it one day, but I have one and a two-year-old. So it's not like happening anytime soon uh, where I go abroad. However, I, uh, I'm a social worker and most of my experience has been doing adventure therapy and experiential education with underserved youth. Um, and I always thought I was gonna run a nonprofit. So, I was on a really different different side of social work, more programming and development. And then I took some time to be a stay-at-home parent during the pandemic and having two kids. And I should say right after grad school, I did work at a Jewish social service agency in Chicago where I worked a lot with Russian immigrants. It was very different than the work I do here, but I did have a, like a little bit of this case management experience. Um, but really I was, I was uh, just kind of thinking about going back to work um, as my kids were getting a little bit older and the Afghan crisis happened and I, I like, can't totally explain it, but I'm reading about everything and I hear 13,000 people are coming to Fort McCoy and oh, what's Fort McCoy? Oh, it's an hour and a half away from Madison. So I turned to my husband, I'm like, I have to go. I don't know what this means. I need to go. Long story, I ended up volunteering there regularly through Catholic Charities and it was it's like the most life changing experience I've ever had. And I'm turning 39. So I always really wanted to find my calling. And that's kind of, I think, where I did. Um, I, I, re I worked in the mother and be at mother and children rooms at Fort McCoy, and then realized that Jewish social services and Madison does refugee work, and it all like worked together. And I ended up taking this job. So it's, I've been here seven months. And so I don't have all that international background. I really wish I did. I'm so lucky. I work my co I have coworkers from all different cultures and our clients and our community partners, and I'm learning so much. And I, I I like just keep learning on this job, but I've never felt so excited about working with a population as I do with refugee resettlement. I just I could go on and on and on, but. I think what happened to me at Fort McCoy is I'm working with people and just looking at, into their eyes and realizing, and it sounds like this might sound a little cheesy, but I'm just thinking like, this could be me. This, this has been our grandparents, our great grandparents. Like there's, this didn't feel like there was that much separation between being a volunteer and being someone at Fort McCoy. Um, and it was just a very intense experience that led me to this. And I absolutely, absolutely love the work we do. And happy to talk about it more, but I really do wish I had done more international um, study and more experience. So if that ever comes up in, in someone's life, like definitely take it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gigi. Yeah, um, I was born in Burundi. It's in Africa, East Africa. Uh, and then after high school, I get a diploma, technical diploma. I didn't have chance to uh, finish my university because I ran away and then be a refugee in Marawi. And then in the refugee Marawi where I was, 
I start to work with, but before I start to work in the Burundi as a peace uh, recon reconciliation and peace facilitator with churches. And when I came in Marawi, um, I was with refugees there and then I work with different organizations. One as a facilitator again, uh, because even in a refugee, there is some conflict. <laughs> yeah. And then I work with uh, the Central Med Support Center as a child minder. When the immigration come there, when they provide um, when they provide the cultural orientation, there are some people who they have to take care of the babies, the kids there, while their mom, they're attending a cultural orientation. I was one of them. Um, and then when I move, um, 2018, when I came here, I started working with refugees again. The new people come here, I was helping them. And then I was help them. The real knowledge I have to help them go to grocery, um, how to use a bus for those who need the basic need English, the real English I was having, I was helping them to understand how to say hi, <laughs> how to say thank you. And then when, uh, um, when GSS hiring people, I was like, okay, I can join uh, this team and then uh, working not as a volunteer, as a staff. And then I joined the group July, um, July 19, uh, 2021. And I'm so happy to help these people because one, I am in the same umbrella as a refugees. And then the second I was living with them, I know how they feel and yeah, I'm so happy to help them. And if you want, welcome, join us. Even myself, sometimes it, it seems challenging me to help Afghanistan people because they, we, are not, we are not the same, <laughs> not the same culture, not the same language, but I try my best. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Um, so, uh, I'll just let everyone know if they do have questions, please enter them into the chat or raise your hand. Uh, so while uh, the participants are thinking of questions, um, I have one that I will ask. Uh, so how can educators support the social and emotional health of refugee students and provide a welcoming environment in their classrooms? Um, so whoever, whoever would like to go first. <laughs> Stephanie, you want to take that one? <laughs> and I was thinking, Becca, you, Becca, you should take that. No, I, I think like maybe we can tag team it, but um, this comes up a lot. I love that question because it's something I think about all the time. We, we, one of the first things that we do is enroll kids in school. And now we're working with so many different districts. I think districts we've never worked before, like uh, Verona, Middleton, Cross Plains, you know, ton of Madison. And um, I think that this is new, like there's a difference between getting kids that don't speak, you know, English is not their first language, but speak a, com a kind of common language versus like Pashto, which is what a lot of our Afghan clients speak. It's just, there's, you know, we're getting so many people that don't speak a, a language anyone's really familiar with. So this has been a little bit of a struggle, um, but I, I get a lot of calls from social workers and, and some of the other faculty at schools where I have clients and we are constantly talking about this. So uh, one thing that I think has been really great is I do appreciate when schools reach out to me and kind of keep me posted and let me know just like, what do you think we could do to support this family? Because it's often really case by case. Um, I really like when, I, I think it's really helpful when schools can make sure that every opportunity for kids is equal. So for example, I have an Arabic speaking family and I know the kids love soccer or you know, football as most of the world calls it. And I think it's really important that these kids know about the activities, especially uh, if there's transportation involved. So I'm always advocating, like I'm always asking the staff, like make sure that you're letting all the families know about all these opportunities and assume they don't know because they can't read flyer if it's not in Arabic and make a special effort. So that's that's like one little piece that I, I've been pushing for a little, um, but Becca, you may have something to add. Um, you know, I, I, I think that teachers, um, I don't know, I think you do a good, great job 
um, making sure that the kids in your classes are are integrated as much as possible. Um, and I think that that's generally good. You know, I think the ESL programs are so important for for these these families, but any any time speaking English for these kids is is really important. Um, I wanted to say something about the, the just the schools and the teachers as much. This is not so much for the kids, but for the parents, for the families is to do your best to treat them how you would treat any other family. So like, you know, we're, we're really helping them a lot, but don't, and, and it's so much easier to talk to us about, about things, but we don't make decisions for the families. They make their own decisions. So it's really important to, um, to nurture that for the families and, and use it like every, every district should have interpretation. And if they don't, that's a problem. So let us know and we'll help advocate for that. Um, but really helping the parents to be decision makers about um, what's going on with their kids is, is really important. Um, also, you know, I guess sort of the standard is like learn a little bit about the cultures um, of, the, of the folks that are your, of the families that are coming into the class. Um, so for example, Eid, Al, Eid al Fitr was on Monday, the end of Ramadan. So, like knowing, just knowing why weren't these kids in school on Monday, and and wishing them a happy Eid, I think that can go a long way. Yeah. Okay. One more quick thing, but I do. I I just yeah. I do think that the schools have been so so kind and warm and very excited to work with our clients overall. And like one of the schools was doing a weekly call with the parents with an interpreter. And I, that might not be scalable depending on what's going on in the school. And I understand that, but I just, I think that overall we've had pretty positive feedback on how the schools are working with our clients. And, and I think it's really awesome. Thank you. Um, I think we have a question from uh, participants. Is it Sophia? Um, just one second here. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay, you, you guys can hear me? Okay, first of all, I wanna say good afternoon. Uh, I just get a ran not a random, but I believe I signed up for some stuff and this is the first time I was uh, I become aware of this program. So I'm very grateful. Uh, the question I have is, is, is open door, let me look the question I have. Do we, do we have a, an office or a volunteer place for open door for refugees here in Milwaukee or is it just a medicine? And, 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 I, and because I, I just wanna finish my questions. I, I'm sure there are a lot of other people. Uh, that's that. So do we have, or oh, on do you need? I'm sure for JCC, if you do, you need volunteers. Uh, I was late, and I don't know how many things were covered, but I myself, I can to say I can relate to that is not even come to comparison. I, I'm from Somalia. I came here as a refugee, young. Um, I was sponsored by Lutheran Social Services. I always say if I ever big win, I mean, if I big the, if I win the lottery, that will be the first place I will give uh, money to, but I can volunteer, I guess, or do something better. So I just wanna let you know that if you need, and uh, I'm a ESL teacher, I know this is not about me, I'll make it short. I'm a ESL teacher at Audubon, so I understand in that. And something that, that Ms. Stephanie said, so, uh, that I just want to emphasize is inclusion of when if you're a classroom teacher inclusion 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 because I like like eat or holidays but I make sure because this time I don't want to be a bias and just teach them Eid and Christmas I make sure that I teach them about Hanukkah I make sure that I teach about uh, 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 festival of lights I make sure that I include because everything is not about Thanksgiving or Christmas. There's Hanukkah, there's, uh, you know, 
different. So I'm not a, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna stop. I feel bad for taking over. Uh, so the, the question I had was, is open doors here do we have in Milwaukee? Thank you. Thank you for that question. So open doors for refugees and JSS are, we're just in Madison, in the Madison area, but there are, you know, it, you worked with LSS. LSS is in Milwaukee and they work with volunteers too. IIW, International Institute of Milwaukee, of Wisconsin is in Milwaukee. And they also work with volunteer organizations. Um, so if you if you look at their websites, I'm sure that they have listed some some volunteer opportunities. Um, and I'm sure that they, you know, you asked if they need volunteers. We need volunteers. Yes, we all need volunteers because we're we're looking to increase our the number of people that we're resettling uh, next year. And I know that likely all the other agencies are are looking at the same the same thing. Great, thank you. Um, so the if we don't have any other questions from the chat, I have a few more. Um, I know you touched on it uh, when all of you were speaking, but what career advice do you have for students interested in refugee development? Uh, so we can start with uh, Becca, if you'd like to go. Um, so career advice, I, I guess the a lot of people getting into this work either have uh, degrees in social work or often they have a background like an immigration they have immigration of some sort in their background uh Gigi shared with us that that she arrived in Madison a few years ago as a refugee so we at JSS we see that experience as um in some ways just as valuable as that social work degree um in in some ways it's more valuable um so <laughs> not that you would want to make your you know it's not not possible to to make yourself a refugee but um i guess you know peace corps is a great way too i that's sort of where i started my journey it just exposes you to different cultures um and sometimes gets you some languages that are are useful um i i got to brush up on my french when i went to senegal so um that's a language that i can speak with some of our some of our african clients as well thank you uh gigi or stephanie do you have advice for for students um i yeah i think my advice would be if you're interested in this kind of work um come volunteer with us <laughs> uh check it out you know there's it's never too late to get a little bit of taste of what it's like to work with uh the population we serve and also um i think like uh, throughout my learning experience at jss the last seven months i have done a lot of things where i have done them wrong or there's a learning curve like it's it's you're working with all these different cultures and I don't want to offend anyone. And I'm, you know, I've done, I've done things that I am not intentionally doing, but like, I just not being afraid to kind of put yourself in an uncomfortable situation to learn and to help people. Like I, the first time I did a home visit with an Afghan family and like all this other family showed up, I wasn't expecting. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, what have I, what am I doing? But I just really sticking with it. It's so rewarding. It's so meaningful. This, unfortunately, the amount of refugees in our world is not going to diminish anytime soon. And, and I just think getting, there's a lot of ways to volunteer and get involved and, and keep learning about what's going on in the world. I feel like I got interested in this stuff a little bit later in my life and I'm happy I'm doing it now, but you know, just keep up with what's going on and, and you might find something that really sparks your interest. Uh, there's a lot of different areas of refugee work, a lot of different things that you can do through different, um, you know, there, you can be a social worker, you can be a teacher, you can do ASL. There's like a million different positions that work with refugees and see what might sound interesting and just try it out. 
Yeah, if you want to have like to know to have an image of a country, if you work with refugees, you're gonna have image of all the country they are from. Uh, I remember when I was uh, not a staff here, when I hear that I will be working with Afghanistan, I have another image on my mind about Afghanistan. It's like I was like, oh, how am I gonna manage this? But the more you are in, you're gonna have another idea. So now I can say the first time I was having right was a six men. I was supposed to provide seal with the six men. One, the Afghanistan men, when you are women, it's kind of. <laughs> and then another thing, it's a black women in front of them want to provide something. So yeah, now I have another image. So try your best. <laughs> If you join, you're gonna have another image. You're gonna learn the different culture and then you're gonna have something new which is gonna be important to you. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat here for uh, Gigi and Sophia. Um, what do you wish people knew about the refugee experience? If you had one message to share, uh, what would it be? So Gigi, if you'd like to start. Stephanie, can you go? I will be the second. The question's not for Stephanie, it's for you and Safia. Do you want Safia to go first? Okay, <laughs> Safia. <laughs> Sorry. Just a second here. Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh, there we uh, go. We're good. Okay, I'm yep. sorry. I my kids tell me you are so into yourself, but hey, you know. Anyway, uh, the question was, uh, what do you wish people to know about the refugee experience? And if you had one message to share, what would it be? Okay, I wanna uh, go back a question. I don't know if it was Stephanie or Miss uh, Schwartz. Becca Schwartz said we we all one time were refugees. Uh, my experience and did not come from Ellis Island, but in a different route. So uh, those of us who, uh, who have immigrants from a generation ago or so can relate to this. But uh, what I wish people to know is just because I am refugee does not mean that I am uh, unintelligent, that I am my situation, uh, that I, um, not everyone speaks English when they come here. And a lot of people uh, associate language with intelligence or with, you know, if you don't speak English, you're dumb. That's not true. And that's what I tell my students. At least that's my experience. Uh, what I would like to know, uh, what I would like to tell uh, people about refugee experience is the refugees are scared. They are, they are, they are self-conscious. They may look standoffish or rude to you due to different cultural uh, things. A lot of people told me that when I was new that I'm on their face and I'm loud. I did not know that <laughs> because our culture, you know, I guess distance is not something we, we you know, we, we are close talkers and, you know, to me and we talk loud at the same time. So I, it still takes me a lot to wait my turn. You know, I, I have to like, okay, wait, this is America. People wait your turn. Hello. Uh, other than that, what I would like people to know is have empathy. Either you're a teacher or a volunteer or um, a normal, you know, we're all here because we care. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not gonna tell this to Becky or Stephanie or to you, I don't know what your name is sir, or, but maybe others who don't directly work with refugees. Um, but empathy, uh, I cannot emphasize that. Even though I'm a refugee, I have the experience, a lot of times I stop myself because I become this, this, this synthesized. And I blame, you know, kids like you can do it. You can then, then again, I don't know your life experience. Your life experience is not mine. I'm an adult. I, you know, and these kids, refugees, they are thrown 
one time I, I took, um, I'll, I'll make it short. One time I, I used to work at Milwaukee Academy of Chinese Languages and they teach Mandarin. So I take this Mandarin thing. I don't, I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean thing. Uh, language speaking uh, Mandarin and I put in a, my, my, our eighth uh, grade class. And then they were, the, the people were speaking Mandarin and everyone was like, I don't know what she's saying. I can't, why are you doing that? And I said, this was a little experiment. This is how the refugees or your friends feel because to them, it might as well be French or, you know, Mandarin. So just be kind and welcome and don't judge. That's uh, I can say, thank you, Sapi. <laughs> I can say that my background, my background plus my culture, it can give me another, an, another identity, which was not before. So let me give you an image. I am Burundian. I was born in Burundi. So I have identity of Burundian, a culture of Burundian people. When I was a refugee in Marawi, I have something else here in Marawi. So this, I don't know if it was good or bad. Some of them maybe was bad. It brings something else. So your help, your kindness, as Sophia said, your passion can help me to change, to become the person who I was before. So most of the people, they are not the same people they was before, but you can help them to become uh, the same people they was before, to have the, the good identity. Uh, if I say identity, it's like, yeah, just have an image about if something happened and then you change. And then if someone else help you, you can come back and smile. So I think you will be happy to see people smile. Um, they need to smile whatever they pass through. Thank you. Great, right. thank you, uh, Sophia and Gigi. Um, we'll have one last chance for questions here. Otherwise we will end the event. Um, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand or enter it into the chat. Um, other than that, I just wanted to say thank you, uh, both Stephanie and Gigi. I know Becca had to leave here, but thank you so much for, for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, it was great to, to hear um, the stories and what it's like to work at a refugee resettlement agency. Um, so if there's no more questions, I think we'll call it a day. Just really quick, I, I really just want to emphasize like we, our team is awesome. We love the work we do and really reach out to us if you have any questions or want to get involved or anything at all. We're so happy to, to talk about it. It's really, we like, I should speak for myself, but we feel, I feel very lucky to do this work. And I know any of us would be happy to talk more about our jobs or how to get involved. So thank, thank you for this opportunity. So, uh, Sophia, did you have a quick question? Uh, one second here. Sorry, go ahead if you had a... Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I raised my hand, but since I have this opportunity, I wanna say thank you guys. Thank you so much. And I, it is my thing. It's either your thing or not your thing. It's my thing to uh, network with uh, groups like you, like the JSS and any group. And I am looking forward more of more meetings of this and thank you. That's all. Great, thank you.